Hey folks, Phil Davis, Ancestry Lands, AncestryLands.com. Hello, happy afternoon to you. Today's this, folks, we're actually going to do a land video, my thoughts on land. What are some of the things that I've learned on land? What do I love about land? What, why did I choose land ownership instead of going into doing maybe a house or a flip or other forms of real estate that were vastly popular at the time before when I decided to start doing land? Simply put, one of the things, folks, let me tell you a little bit about this journey and how I started into land ownership. For those that care, you know, you might you might not know. A, at the time, I was living in Northern California with my wife. We were then, yes, married. And at that time in Northern California, you may not know it around a couple, few years back, about six, seven years back, there were these large fires in the Northern California region that literally burned down many, many homes tragically uh, in that area. It was unknown at the reason why those fires were started. Later, it was to be found that faulty wiring or lack of maintenance in the California state on a whole was one of the contributing factors because they do not maintain the power lines in the more rural areas of California, Northern California, because there's a lot of areas where um, it, it's not all just farmland and everything else. There are a lot of areas that are very wooded, uh, mountainous areas where there's a lot of wildlife and there are homes up in there in those spaces where unfortunately the they're not well maintained they're not not well maintained at all and through that these power lines trees fall down things of that sort and the power lines you know apparently go with them and catch fire and then Californians also had a very dry season recently through the lack of rain, this is b before the lakes, when the lakes, Lake Mead had uh, gone down to like well below 50%. And that was a right for fires. And this normally never happened in this area beforehand. At the same time, my wife and I, with our two young children, I believe my daughter was maybe four, my son was about two. We were traveling or made way to New York City via our NRV. I think I've done a video about the fires that happened at one time. And we took an RV and took a road trip cross country. And at that time, I was, I think at that time, real estate was really popular were short sales and uh, still flips, you know, but it was buying distressed properties and flipping them for a profit, short sales. So always love this and people just don't let you in, never knowing that I could just get ahead of you by taking my own lane. So you won't let me in and then I'll just get in a lot further than where you were from before. People driving 101, you know, you could just let me in now or I could just get up ahead of you and, and get in earlier. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, sweetie. So any which way, um, we drove cross country. And before that, in Northern California, these homes, which if you know anything about Northern California, Napa County area to be exact, Sonoma County is where we actually lived in, but Napa County, wine country, is a you know more well-known area. There are a lot of wineries, Kendall Corbin wineries up there, uh, the uh, Francis Cork Coppola winery is in that area. I visited there, it's a very lovely winery. I would recommend it, it's something good to see there. Francis, the director, Francis Cork Coppola. And at that time, the homes had burned down to the ground. So pretty much, it was just vacant land. In the midst of that, people saw an opportunity to make a large amount of money. These homes that normally went for four or 500,000 were burnt down and they were buying up the raw land for maybe 100,000, 125,000. Now again, you might ask, these are probably one or two acre properties, correct? Nope, they actually were not one to two acre properties, they were probably a point one, maybe even smaller. These are properties that are about maybe 5,000, 6,000 square feet of actual land, leading you to build about a maybe 1,200 to 1,500 square foot home. That means that you got a little bit of yard. Yes, California is very similar to the boroughs in New York City, where the homes are pretty much six feet apart from the side of your home to the next the side of the next home. It's a very tight, 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 um, you know, layout full of where the housing is concerned. 
much like New York City and Staten Island to be exact where I graduated college and resided for some short amount of years afterwards. Very houses are very close together and the neighborhoods are very tight. Lot parking is an issue in most neighborhoods. Average lot size in California is about a 0.1 to 0.15. About 6,534 square feet. Much like many of the lots that I sell on ancestrylands.com. We do have a lot that are bigger, but everybody always wants two, three acre properties, never understanding why that is actually a bad idea in most places. So, I started taking notice of that. Many of the nurses that I worked with at a hospital, wide hospital throughout California known as Kaiser Permanente Hospital. The nurses there had lost, many of the nurses had lost their homes as they lived in the surrounding area. I lived about a town or two over from that immediate area which had burned down. And they were getting developers at offering them cash money upwards to $200,000 for their actual land. Just the bare bone lands itself. Started thinking a little bit, you know, like they offer you 160 cash, yes. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is what they offer for burnt down land. You know why? Because they were gonna develop that land over again. Then I heard on the news, this was in the RV. This is what I talk about paying attention to clues and signs in your life. I'm listening on the news where they had developers going in buying these, these plots of land that have been burnt down. There's no house on this at all, right? 100, 200,000, building up homes, selling them for six, seven, 800,000, sometimes upward to a million. The same home that would have sold before for three to 400,000 in most cases. Same home, just a new home. Not better quality of a home. They were just gonna take the land and build and sell. That was their model. And they were going to make hand over fist for extra profit. Now, some people may say, yeah, you know, but after they build, they cost of construction, blah, blah, blah. But still, $200,000 worth of a profit, let's say it took you, cost you two to buy it, cost you another two or maybe even four thousand, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 to actually build the house, which is really overestimating the property there. But if you sold it for $800,000, which they were selling for at the time, you still to stand and make a two hundred thousand dollar profit, roughly, and for most people, that's a good chunk of change. People say, "Oh, that's not a lot of money." Listen, make it twenty thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, a drop in a bucket. But hey, it looks good when it's in your bank account. I'll take it any day. And they're doing that not once, but twice, two, three, four times, just flipping it. Hold, hold streets being redeveloped. And not everybody was able to get the lot for that cash. Sometimes they had debts, other forms, things that could be absolved and they could get the property for even cheaper on the dollar. So I started really paying attention to this, watching what was unfolding. Again, I was into buying distressed homes, but I saw that the power in and ownership of vacant land, you could you know, potentially buy these people willing to buy these for hundred six some thousand. Now, again, most of the nurses were emotionally devastated behind the loss of their home, belongings, and this, this, and this. But they were selling them homes. Trust me, selling them. And when it came slow time to get the homes rebuilt, and a lot of people's homeowners insurance didn't kick in the right way, selling became a very, very lucrative and appealing option. Considering they they would get money from their insurance too as well. So why not take the extra profit on top of that? Some people, yes, did want to rebuild their homes and start anew. But for other people, they would left it in the hands of a developer. Which is why I paid attention. Because if a developer finds building a home to be somewhere up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit, then why not own land as an individual and you could do the same thing if you wanted to, if you chose to. But it taught me something about the power of vacant land. Now again, we don't sell the properties on AncestryLands.com for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would love to, but we make sure they're very affordable for all the people of all walks of life, credit or no credit. It's not That's not what we're focused on. We want to provide you a framework and a model of ownership. That's what we're selling. The ability, the ability to leverage land through ownership to give you power, something tangible. So I'm taking this trip, still in my mind wondering if I'm going to do distressed homes or 
and land wasn't even a thought in my mind at that point. Traveling through I-80, that's the northern route. You're traveling through areas like Iowa, Nevada, you know, went through Reno, uh, Ohio, Illinois. You're going through that route to get across the United States. I'm going to go see my brother in New York. I'm starting to see billboard signs for land for sale. 99 bucks down, a couple hundred dollars a month. Bill, big billboard signs as I'm stopping for gas in the RV to fill it up. I'm looking and noticing like, man, you know, this is crazy. And I, I, and I had no idea that you could buy land like that, like the way I sell it. No clue. No clue. I had not talking to my family members who had told me that my grandfather, Samuel Nick Blow, had already been doing this before I was even born. I had no idea because I had lost that information until I actually started doing land and talked to one of my uncles later on who told me about it. I'm starting to look, look, look like, man, they're selling land, buying land, $99 down, and where's this land at? It looks like it's way, way far out. And I started saying to myself, you know, people are spreading out and land's going to become really important one day. Not knowing that's a foolish statement as land has always been important. It, land's always been valued throughout history. In fact, if you didn't know anything about this country, even if when you were a white person, person uh, in this country when there were slaves and people did not have rights, women did not have rights. One of the main criteria in order for you to vote, this is at the time of the, the constitution being made, you had to own property. You couldn't just be white as most people would think that you need to be. You actually had to have some land and title to your name in order to vote. The property of ownership of humans was not the only thing. You did not need that to be the person that decided if you voted. You needed to own land in this country to even vote. So again, land ownership in the inception of this country, if you don't understand how this country was built upon, you don't understand that you're never going to change the country unless you understand the rules of the game. And they have not changed. The people want them to change, but they are not changing. And if they do change, they're still not going to change in your favor because the underlying, the master mode, the underlying main rules that the elite abide by are not the rules that they are setting for us plebs or the lower society. And I don't mean lower meaning poor. I'm talking about everything below that line that established what is an elite and what is not an elite. Because again, those same tenets that the country was built upon, they still hold true. It's just, yeah, everybody has the power to vote or the illusion to vote. But again, the tenets of power still reside in who owns land. And the reason why I can explain that shortly is that, again, when you own a mortgage, guess who still owns the title to the deed of ownership to the property? Your bank does. You're making payments in the form of a mortgage to own the title of ownership in this country. And everyone has a mortgage. Very few percent of the population have actually paid off a house. But you're told that you're a home owner. Right? And I did a video before talking about ownership implies responsibility. Yes, you are making a, you have a contract in the form of a mortgage for ownership. It is a contract for ownership, but you do not own it unless you have the title. The title of ownership is given once you actually pay off that mortgage. You now own your home. People don't understand that. That was set up in a way to enrich the people in power. Understand the rules of the game, which is why, again, land is always important. So the banks own the home. You don't pay off the mortgage, the bank takes back the home, which they actually really already had anyway. Really what they're taking back is your residence at the home. Your ability to claim residence or reside at that place is all they're taking away from you. All monies paid towards that mortgage are forfeited. You also get the additive of bad credit or foreclosure. Hell, you could even be put in collections. 
But again, you're left to ruin because you did not understand the rules of the game. Now, I would love for anyone to comment here and tell me how I'm wrong about this. And again, am I saying don't buy a home? Absolutely not. <laughs> I would. You're never going to find me, a landowner, tell you that you shouldn't buy real estate. But again, understanding what you're buying, understanding the rules of the game, and having a strategy, having a purpose, having a measure of discipline. Shout out to Don Coombs. Of why you're doing and buying this house. So either one, are you going to own it? You're going to take property, but again, you have your financial future in the hands of the bank. You're limited in what you can do because again, you can only sell, but again, you got to pay the bank. Bank is your pimp. Deciding what you can and can't do because you could sell that home, but you can't do anything until you pay the bank off first. And the market decides how much profit you get. So again, when I started factoring in these things, distressed homes, which are people who are into you know their mortgage or they're having problems with their mortgage, you come in, you can pay off the mortgage, get them out of their mortgage, get them out of that debt, assume ownership of the home, and then sell it quickly for a profit or a value that is pretty much not your actual investment. You're pretty much paying off the portion of the mortgage that the owner now can no longer pay. Sometimes you can pay and get them for a profit. You can give them a little extra money to walk away from it. So that way they're absolved of their debt, make a little chunk of change, and you still are able to make the vast profit because you assume the market equity that's built into the house. You can assume that. It's a great thing, but it actually is a dangerous game if you do not do your homework. Now, I did not learn all I needed to know. I didn't take a lot of real estate school. So I, I said, you know, that might be a little too advanced for a person like me at that time. Because I didn't understand land. I didn't understand zoning. I didn't have my book, Getting Dollars from Dirt, which is on Amazon, to read as a reference. And I would encourage you to go there to get that book because that book would have served me well. Knowing who to go to in the county. Knowing what zoning I'm looking at. What are your zoning regulations, what are your standards, what I look at as far as any property that I can buy that adds value to it, what are improvements up there, can you do anything additional, like put a pool in or add an, an uh, what is that called, additional dwelling unit, an ADU, AD as in dog, U, additional dwelling unit. I didn't know those things that are put into that 55 page book they give you the nuts and bolts of how to own real estate at the land level. Something that developers know all too well. That's why they are millionaires and they have million dollar companies because again, he who develops the land controls what the house sells for. Think about that for a second. So as I'm going cross country, visiting all these different places which I've never seen before, never seen Iowa on the ground level. I've only, I've only flew over top of Iowa. I started to look at America in a different light. Started to see different areas, how people lived. Iowa was mostly flat. Homes were very far spaced apart. And you could see why Iowa was very important in the sense of all the farmland that's there. Because it's feeding America. Some would say, oh, why would I want to own 120 acres out in Iowa? Well, because the farmland is valuable. And if we look now in today's economy, guess who's buying up farmland, right? Your favorite guy, Bill Gates. Right? And other wealthy people. When it, economic times are hard and inflation is high, they run, the elite run to real estate. They don't run to homes. They don't run to houses. That's for private investors and large corporations. But wealthy people put their money in land. Because of the little things I'm going to tell you about land right now. With lands, you don't have any tenants. There is no one to fight over with moving out of your place because they did not pay. Or because there's a domestic issue. Or they lost their job. You do not have to deal with that when it comes to land. 
The land has been there before you got there, since the dinosaurs have existed, since Pangea, it's either underwater or above water was a mountain, and now it's a hill or it's a flat plateau. The earth has always had that land there in that spot, or it was formed at some point in time, but pretty much it's been there far longer than you will ever be here in your life, and it will be here after that life is gone and extinguished out of your life. Once you are gone and down part of the land, the land will still be there. Every plot. So I started looking at that, that's a great bonus. The other benefit was it was a low barrier to entry, meaning that for a couple thousand dollars, I could buy something, I could pay more for a car than I could for a property. It sounds great again. Only problem is where? Location, 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 right? It's always to tell you, real estate. I'm a real estate, real estate is location, location, location. Now here's the one thing you gotta be concerned about is that when you go for location, the better location, the more it is going to cost, whether it's dirt or a house. It's going to cost much more when it's in what we call prime location. The heart of a city, well-developed area, the more expensive the houses around it, the more expensive the land. And no one wants to live in a ghetto, right? Not, people that live in a ghetto don't wanna live in a ghetto. They wanna live in a better place. So the other part about that, why are you breaking, dude? You have, there's no one breaking in front of you. You have 18 car lengths ahead of you. And this car, this is what I'm talking about. Listen, folks, if you are this person in front of me in the left lane with nothing but two, if you can't see it, but there's, there's about a football stadium in front of this person. Get over. You're braking because people in the right lane are braking. But again, you need to drive in your lane. There's ability to speed up. Lord, this kills me any which way so it's the location proximity right I don't have to worry about any plumbing no leaks no maintenance there's no maintenance needed on land raw land requires you to have no maintenance you have a house you're renting out a house you still got to do repairs when your tenants rule number one benefit that land bends over a house when you're renting a house the tenants will destroy your house so there's upkeep Repairs, carpet, wear and tear, even the best tenants, they're going to put wear and tear on any building that they reside in. Carpet comes up, animals pee on the carpet, children spill, a whole litany of things happen when you have tenants. Because humans occupy space, they, they tend to wear down the walls, anything, paint, chips. So you've got to deal with maintenance. And again, we see now with the economic times we're in... Goods and labor become very expensive depending on what time you're in. These economic hardships, goods and labor are very expensive. People are worried about buying eggs. They're not worried about buying paint. You're going to prioritize. So I did not have to worry about that when it came to land. I had the benefit of seeing that, hmm, I don't have to worry about maintenance either. The other one is pest. There's no pest issues. What about raccoons, rats, rodents? There's no sitting out to the Terminex guy. I don't have to worry about ants because ants naturally live there. And again, I did not have to worry about a high overhead. There was no rounding daily, monthly cost to operating this. No mortgage. Once you buy it outright, you get the title. That's it. You're done. The only thing you got to do is the same thing that happens with every property is that, again, you got to pay county taxes. And the taxes are influenced by... The proximity of the land, the prime location of the land. If you have things like utilities on the lot, which is another checklist. We have that on Ancestry Lands. I wanted a property with utilities on there. Because again, land sells better when it has water in front of it. A water line. That means that you don't have to bring water to you. And water is a precious resource. Water is so precious, it used to be free once upon a time, and now it's not. It's rarely any place you can go to get free water. And it, it, hell, in some areas, some states, you can't even collect the water out of the daggone sky that falls because it's illegal. So again, when I start looking at this, I formulate it on how I'm going to strategically buy properties. Because I wanted land that people could buy to live on. Or 
they can enjoy the benefits of the same checklist that I did when I bought the land. The things I was looking for, the things I wanted people to look for when they were buying a lot. Never knowing that I would be an author one day and teach these actual principles in a book for those to be educated long after I'm gone. And the other part was having power, being in a city area, which is why California City, once I found that area, looked so very optimistic. It's only an hour and a half from the LA area. Now, your feelings about California aside, California is a very attractive place because of the migrants that are coming up through the border. The Asians that are coming through there, they want land. Not everybody wants to live in LA. People want a place they can retire. And honestly, most people who don't like California have never been to California. California is actually a very beautiful state. Not all of California is what you see on the news, which is why people like to live in the outskirts. You start looking at those outskirts, you start looking at where is the affordable place to live at. In a big metropolitan area like LA, it's gonna be expensive very far out, just like New York City, even North, New York City, North Jersey, which is a kind of borough or outskirts of New York City, is pretty expensive. You gotta go about an hour or so away to start getting to affordable real estate outside of the New York area. Well, same thing in this in principle. Because I used my own home state when I lived in New Jersey at the time with the College of New York to use as a point of reference. Typically, New Yorkers move out of the city and they reside and plant down in North Jersey, which is why if you look on anything such as like Jersey Shore, you'll see people who sound like they're from New York because people from New York want to go into homes. They want a little bit of suburban feel and they move right outside of the outer part of the city. That drives the prices up. Now, you see the same thing happening after the pandemic or pandemic, depending on what you want to call it. And people started doing that in other states, driving real estate up in those states where it naturally wasn't there before. To the benefit of the current homeowners and detriment, might I add. So the same thing could be said in the local area when you're looking at L.A. Immediate outside of L.A. in areas like Lancaster, Palmdale, they're experiencing a big boom in real estate. And that's great. You might want to go in and grab at that, but you're going to be paying for top dollar. Because the local residents are now aware that people are leaving the city and they're looking to settle in those birds. So I looked a little bit further out. I found California City, about 30 minutes away from this area that's blowing up. Because again, once that area gets priced out, now people got to move out a little bit further. California's right, California City's right in that sweet spot. About an hour and a half away from LA. Great for remote workers. It's got Spectrum, which is a, you know, internet company, telephone company out there. Con Edison, which is, or SoCal Edison, which is Con Edison or PG&E for anyone who knows. Utility company for power. SoCal Gas also services that area. I'm checking off more lists because you can opt for gas. California loves to have solar, great on rebates. So you start looking at this and again, when you start thinking like an owner, you start looking at this strategic advantage of this area and you start saying, hmm, what I've now got to do is wait. And that's what I decided to do. Wait for what? Wait for time to come by and let these areas start to get the overflow of people. You got millions of migrants coming through that area every few years. They settle into those big areas, those big cities. Listen to my strategy now. Follow with me. Because this was five years ago where I thought about this. They're going to get all these social programs, which we, the taxpayers, are complaining about giving and to get money. Now you got Biden giving them out, you know, EBT cards for migrants. You don't got to like it, but it's happening in New York City, too, as well. Only problem is most people can't buy in New York City because the real estate is too dag on afford. Um, it's too dag. It's too dag unaffordable, expensive. So when you look at California City, it's right in the right price. Yeah, people are moving out, but there are people moving in, too. So you think like an owner, you start thinking about the strategic advantage. So now you got these people moving in here, and guess what? Those people have cash on them. They got over here, and then they get over here for free. Staying here, they're getting a lot of the benefits because we, the taxpayers, are paying for it. We're fronting their bill. And again, unless we're going to vote out a different policy, I'm okay with it because that's the law of the land nowadays. You can't change it. It sucks, but hey, it is what it is. So, 
Now I'm looking at this place even more. So for those who want to own property, look at those things that I've outlined in you and take a look back at California City. Go to AncestryLands.com and look at some properties. Go on to our YouTube video, which you're seeing now, and look at the properties we have and think like an owner. Think like an investor. Looking at the area and saying, hmm, I can see the growth potential here. I can see why I need to buy a property from Philip. He's got prices now, but again, he doesn't charge interest. He doesn't do credit checks. He'll allow me to secure a property today and I can pay it off in five years. And by the time I finish paying him off, there'll be some meat on the bones for me to sell it right away. So he's allowing me to do a flip at the same time, locking in my prices and I could pay off at any time. Sounds like a strategic investment to me. Go into the description section, folks. You'll see my a link to the video. Um, actually, a link to my book, Getting Dollars from Dirt, A Beginner's Guide to Vacant Land Investing by yours truly. And get some foreknowledge on what you need to look for when you're looking at properties. I mean, are you sit down there getting your, uh, your, your, your menthols over there? What are you doing? Lights green. Pay attention. So, again, folks, my book on Amazon, Getting Dollars from Dirt, like, comment, subscribe. This is what you need to look for no matter where you are. But again, I'm giving you all this game, this knowledge, these gems, this thought process to increase your power and holding, all right? Remember, folks, you either own property or you'll be owned as property. Phil Davis, signing off. I'm out. Thanks. Are you confused with today's real estate market? With high interest rates and overpriced housing, it can be hard to find something to own at the right price. Available on Amazon, Getting Dollars from Dirt by author Philip H. Davis is a game-changing book that invites you to embark on a thrilling exploration of this often overlooked asset class. This book is your roadmap to unlocking the secrets of vacant land investment. Inside these pages, you'll uncover the transformative power of vacant land as a wealth-building tool. Discover how to spot promising properties, assess their true value, and capitalize on market trends. From understanding zoning and permits to leveraging financing strategies, you'll gain the knowledge and confidence to make savvy investment decisions. With each page you turn, you'll gain a deeper understanding of the profound impact your investments can have on the world around you. Getting dollars from dirt is not just a guidebook, it's a call to action. Whether you're a seasoned investor or a curious novice, this book will empower you to tap into the immense potential of vacant land and embark on a journey toward financial freedom and a brighter future.